This uh, cutting here is the first really report of it in the uh, Wharfdale Observer. To remember, it's a, a weekly paper that's published on a Friday. So this is in the edition of the 12th of, of June. And uh, so I'm going to sort of, uh, I've got a, a number of uh, slides and things like that, which I can show uh, to tell you where some of these places are. But I'm going to start off with the, uh, really the story from the parents' point of view to begin with. Uh, and we find out that the girl, Barbara Warthouse, is five years and five months of old, the daughter of David and Elizabeth uh, Waterhouse. He's a quarryman, age 35, and he lives behind the Alma Inn, which is now a dentist on Town Street, uh, next door to the Black Bull. And the, I've got a photograph later on, the passage still exists uh, down there. It's got a wooden door across that. And if you go round into the car park of the Black Bull, you can still see that tiny passage appearing. Uh, and it appears sort of uh, from behind uh, the Alma pub and the, what was Pizza Express uh, there, which is stripping out at the moment. Uh, and so you can still see where these cottages stood. There's a row of four of them. Quite a few families lived in them, so we'll see that uh, um, some of the other neighbours of theirs actually cohabited uh, uh, with other people as well. So quite small cottages, but lots of people in them. And that was really the reason why they stand, uh, don't stand anymore, because they were demolished. Uh, the other place I'm going to mention all the time is the uh, uh, where the Turners lived, uh, which is right at the top of Back Lane, uh, number one Back Lane, uh, and that was a former beer house as well, and that's been uh, demolished in the 1960s. Although I suspect uh, even in the 1890s, it really wasn't a fit place to live uh, because the floorboards upstairs uh, were rotten. Anyway, that's getting beyond it. So, uh, uh, and it's probably to say that uh, she seemed to be quite a precocious child because uh, on the week uh, following the 6th of June, sorry, preceding the 6th of June, uh, one of the neighbours called her Bab. And, but with considerable emphasis, the newspaper report says, and dignity replies, I'll let you know, but don't call me Bab. My name is Barbara. So correcting her around there. So the girl left home on the Alma Yard on Saturday morning, about a quarter past 11, so the report says, for the purpose of playing out of doors. And so far as can be ascertained, she was not seen by anyone who knew her after one o'clock, at which hour she was, along with some playmates, standing outside a shop window in town street somewhere about the cooperative stores the cooperative stores on this plan of these two uh, buildings up here this is the arcade a bit further down there and they were going to say there were other sort of yards and that one being sort of behind it but these are the uh, co-op stores and uh, say according to testimony these people appeared up in court uh, and that's what i've been reading out all the time is that uh, what people saw of her the testimony here is a Thompson Bussey. Uh, the Bussey family lived further down. In fact, uh, uh, they uh, had a butcher's shop here at Church End uh, for quite a lot of years. Uh, I've mentioned before in the 1890s, Orsini Bussey. Uh, we'll probably see a bit more of him in the 1890s because he showed lots of rabbits at uh, sort of uh, shows and things like that. Uh, and so Thompson Bussey, uh, he was aged about seven at the time. <coughs> and he saw the deceased in front of a shop window in Town Street Hall of about a quarter past one on the afternoon of the sixth inst. She was with another girl, who we find later on is called Ethel Whittam, and pointing to a portrait in the window said it looked like her father. So we have testimony here from Joshua Whittam, uh, which I think is the uh, elder uh, 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 brother of Ethel. He was aged 23 and living on Town Street. He's a cousin of uh, Mrs. Waterhouse and a forge labourer. So I guess he worked down at Kirkstall Forge. Uh, and she told him, I'm going up town. Uh, so but that's why people assumed when they first talked about her is that she was last seen up here and was then going to continue up town. Uh, as they said, I forgot to mute people. So I've just heard some coughing before I've muted you all now. So they assumed that she was going to head upwards uh, from Town Street. And therefore, just moving on to the next slide here, 
is that uh, really there's lots of relatives of the water houses uh, uh, living in, in Horsa. So it becomes quite confusing. Uh, but the newspaper report says that Mrs. Waterhouse, uh, who is a Scotch woman, has no relatives in the district at all. It was thought probably that the girl had gone to one of her father's relatives who resided in the township. But a visit to one and all of these only added to the distress and of the now heartbroken parents, as in no single instance could any tidings be gained of a missing child. During Saturday and Sunday night, the parents and friends instituted a thorough search, but it was not until 5 a.m. on Monday morning that information was given to the police. The matter being recorded, uh, reported to PC Bulmer in Horsef, who immediately entered the fact into the official books at the police station, together with a description of the missing girl, who is the youngest but two of a family of seven. Uh, this is uh, the uh, Alma Yard when it goes on to two pages. That's why they're, they're split apart there. So you can see that they uh, have the youngest daughter aged just two months, who would have been about sort of, uh, uh, that mean April. So three, uh, she'd been aged five months. Uh, and because they're the eldest there, been up to the age of 13 at the time. You see that he's uh, described as a quarryman. We'll learn a bit, a bit more about him later on. So Alma Yard, this is what I'm talking about. It's this gate here stands between the dentists. That's the former Alma Inn pub, uh, the Black Bull there. That's the gate that comes out here, and that's the passageway that comes out behind it. So really, we've got the former Alma pub there. And then next door, as you can see, the former Pizza Express, which forms this building here. So these cottages stood in this area around here. And they give a description of her. She was a stout of stout build with dark eyes and hair cut short, dressed in a blue cloth cap, black cashmere frock, brown holland pinafore trimmed with turkey red, black stockings and lace boots, all far worn. The father, who has not been uh, to his work since last Saturday, travelled many weary miles in search of tidings of his daughter, visiting several of the surrounding townships. He also visited Leeds, having received information that a child had been found there, but his journey proved futile, as did the journey to Bradford by a couple of friends, similar information having been received after the finding of a child in that place. But up to Wednesday evening, not the slightest clue had been found uh, uh, to the discovery of the child. By some, it was conjectured the girl had wandered, had wandered away into one of the woods in the district and so got lost. But a search of ease proved to be of no avail. The possibility of having got to the river and fallen in was also suggested. But this was considered to be very unlikely, as the river is some distance away from that part of Horses where the child lived whilst the few ponds in the neighbourhood are still more difficult of approach. Naturally, a good deal of sympathy was expressed with the parents, who, it is needless to say, feel very deeply the sad occurrence. At midnight on Wednesday, however, a discovery was made at Leeds, which has explained the strange disappearance of the little girl in a manner far more shocking than the worst fears of her parents and friends warranted. At the time just named, what has proved to be her mutilated body was found at the back of the municipal buildings in Leeds. That's the art gallery and library. There's a road that runs as an L shape around it. The facts of the case are almost too horrible to relate and the murderous business for murder, it is undoubtedly is of a vilest kind, is more like the work of a fiend or a madman that of, than, than that of any sane human being, however debased. Nothing more foul and ghastly is remembered by the Leeds police to have occurred within the borough for 30 or 40 years. But here is the cruel story itself. At half past 11, uh, this is a policeman patrolling the area, he patrolled the uh, back street of Alexander Street at 10.15, really an hour earlier. On Wednesday night, Police Constable William Moss was going uh, his rounds in the neighbourhood of the municipal buildings, examining the doors and doorways as usual and seeing that all was right. Ten minutes later, this is 11.40pm, he came across a mysterious looking bundle lying within a gateway of Alexander Street at the back of the municipal buildings. He flashed his lantern onto it and his suspicions were aroused immediately and were confirmed the next moment when he turned the bundle over and to his horror caught sight of a child's knee protruding through an old shawl which formed the covering of whatever had yet to be revealed to his gaze. He surmised at once that a dead body lay inside and the policeman's ready sense of duty, he blew his whistle to summon assistance. 
In response, Inspector Thackeray and Police Sergeant Craddock, both who were on street duty at the time, came upon the scene. And on learning the reason of the call, they at once procured the hand ambulance and conveyed the body to the town hall, where it was placed in a room for examination. Meanwhile, Inspector Palmer, the officer in charge of the police station, with praiseworthy promptitude, communicated with Inspector Stansfield for the West Riding Police, in whose district the missing girl, Waterhouse, had lived, also with the heads of department of the Leeds Police. Superintendent Stansfield dispatched an officer on horseback to Horseth, distant about five miles from the scene of discovery, to communicate the sad intelligence to the parents of the murdered child and with a view of their going to Leeds as early as possible yesterday morning to remove all doubt, whatever, as to the identification. So we've got this very macabre uh, photograph here, which has uh, appeared, uh, I think it's in the museum on the wall, uh, I, I believe. It's also appeared in a book on Horsef as well. And uh, so it, it continues uh, when the... Uh, the surgeon comes to have a look at this at Harper's 12 as how badly the mutilated the body is. So this is drawn from two or three accounts that have been written and have compiled them together. The little victim's face has been left uninjured and she looks as though she was asleep. With regard to the rest of the body, it would be difficult to give any adequate dis idea of the foul wounds, variously uh, reported as 43, 45, and 46 stab wounds and cuts across her body. Uh, and they're the major ones. It's already reported there were some minor marks as well, uh, which have been wrought upon her. To begin with, whatever the object of the assassin, he ripped the poor girl completely up from up the middle, leaving the intestines protruding. It's thought that a, uh, a knife uh, did this, probably a, uh, a pocket knife. Uh, as though he were intent upon committing a deed of daring and devilish as that own person who styles himself Jack the Ripper. He has added to this cruel indignity and abominable crime by cutting out and removing certain parts. Parts Such is the terrible character of the awful deed, as disclosed when the remains came to be cross-examined at an early hour yesterday morning. Nor is this all. The child's throat has been cut and it's jagged from ear to ear. The little legs are hewn and carved in all directions and indeed almost severed from the trunk. But the legs have been doubled up so that the body, when tied up in a parcel, might not be very bulky. As later added, both thighs were slashed inside and out, as if with a sharp knife. On each buttock was a deep uh, cut wound. Uh, there were also cuts on the fingers that she uh, proved that she struggled with the attacker at the time. But really that cut that came right up her, uh, uh, from her abdomen to her chest it was proved to be the fatal one. He extended his fierce, fearful brutality to the cutting of square shaped uh, pieces from the hips. Almost all these wounds were inflicted after her death. All the children's uh, child's clothes were on and also her stockings and boots, but could easily be lifted up to expose the child's whole body. It was marked that there was no blood on the body at all. The only signs of bleeding was the dried stains on the underclothing. And it looks as if the murderer had been very careful to drain the blood from the body before it was removed. It was thought uh, that the blood was drained down the sink uh, in the house, uh, but there was no evidence found of any blood in the drainage pipes, which they dug up later. later. Uh, and the suggestion was that she actually probably might not have been uh, killed at one back lay, the former old boot and shoe uh, alehouse, uh, and she might have been actually murdered somewhere else. But this was, uh, uh, has been never been sort of fully uh, investigated into. Mr. Ward, the police surgeon, who with others was called to the town hall directly the affair was discovered, uh, they were called out at 12.30 a.m., declined to pass any opinion as to the outrage until he received instructions for a post-mortem. He, however, gave it as his conviction that the child, who he said had been most frightfully mutilated, though his opinion that some of the gashes must have been made some time after death, had not been dead more than 24 hours which in the case of the murder must have been performed sometime during the previous night, the Tuesday night, um, the, uh, uh, the 8th of, uh, of June, 1891. And like I say, on the chest, there was a white powder, which the police constables thought might be flour, but Mr. Ward pronounced it to be chloride of lime. The remains were wrapped up in a very old and much worn plaid 
plaid shawl, which was screwed up and tied uh, tightly in a knot. And when the covering was removed, the body was seen to be bent together, the knees pressed towards the chest and the head resting between the knees. At two o'clock yesterday morning, the remains were taken from the town hall to the mortuary in Milgar Street, there to wait actual identification and also a coroner's inquest. Yesterday morning, Detective Superintendent Gillespie, the Chief of Leeds Detective Force, was on duty early, as were most of his cleverest men. They held a long consultation in a private room of Mr Gillespie, and when the parents of the deceased child came and experienced no difficulty in identification, identifying the mutilated body as to that of their infant daughter. Superintendent Gillespie had, then into his, had them into his room, and whilst expressing every sympathy with them, questioned them closely with a view to obtaining even the slightest clue to work upon. For, said Superintendent Gillespie, if you can only get the slightest clue, we'll follow it up. After the interview uh, had lasted some considerable time, Superintendent Gillespie, Detective Inspector Kershaw, and Detective Sergeant Bates went across to the place where the body was found, at the side of the municipal buildings. There is an entrance to the loading yard and adjoining drapery warehouse, Edmondson's stuff warehouse. The officers were somewhat nonplussed by the absence of any signs, but the sharp eye of Mr Gillespie detected a white substance embedded in the intersees of the paving stones. This was at once picked upon uh, uh, with the point of a pocket knife and placed on a sheet of paper. It was arranged that the inquest of the murder girl should be opened in the town hall today at two o'clock, a post-mortem examination of a body to be made in the meantime by Dr Ward. The parents, because uh, they're coming back up into Horsef, uh, in the company of Sergeant Poiso Horsef, arrived at Leeds by the 5.42 a.m. train from Ewley yesterday morning and were met by Detective Sergeant Tidswell. They were at once taken to the mortuary where the father was allowed to see the child's face and clothes, but was not permitted to see the mutilations. He was deeply affected and sobbing, poor Barbara. Uh, and so he was led away from the mortuary. Some doubts were entertained as to the advisability of allowing the mother to see the child, but as she pleaded very hard, she was led into the room where her daughter's body lay. The sight of what had been so dear was, however, too much for her fortitude, and she fell to the floor in a dead faint. The poor woman was at once removed and restoratives were applied so that in a few minutes she was brought round. She seemed, however, somewhat stunned with grief and her pitiful condition excited much commiseration. A representative of the press had an interview with the mother of the deceased yesterday morning. She was terribly affected and it was with difficulty she answered his questions. She said, my name is Elizabeth Waterhouse. She was age 31 at the time and I live at Alma Yard, Horseth. My little girl was five years old last January. About a quarter past 11 on Saturday forenoon, she left the house, as she said, to go and play. At dinner time, she had not come home, so I went outside, but could not see her anyway. I was very frightened and asked my neighbours if she'd seen or heard of her. My cousin, who I knew, said he had seen her in Town Street. He asked her where she was going, and she said, up town. He then went on his way and so saw no more of her. Every inquiry was made, but not a single person had seen or heard of her. All the ponds about home were dragged, but nothing was found. This morning at 2.30 a.m., the wife of Sergeant Poyser of Horse came to my house with the dreadful news that a little un had been found in Leeds, and then she thought that it might be mine. We were greatly alarmed, but heard nothing more until we were told to come to Leeds. This morning, we, my husband and I, came by an early train accompanied by Sergeant Poyser. We saw the body at the mortuary in Milgar Street, and I at once recognised it as my little girl. Uh, we saw the body at the mortuary in Milgar. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I have not the slightest idea of anyone who would have abducted her from the home. She was a grand lass uh, and everyone knew her in the town. She has never strayed away before. She attended both the weekday and Sunday school. That's the Wesleyan school that stood behind the Grove uh, School on New Street. Uh, and so far as I've heard, there's been no suspicious character seen in Horsef lately. It is thought not improbable that the murder has been committed by a tramp, for a shawl found upon the body is evidently that of some person in poor circumstances. 
probably thinks the detective a frequenter of lodging houses, for in one place there is a patch, and at some time the shawl has worn so threadbare that it has been doubled over and sewn down. It's added uh, in another report, it is a piece of slaty brown Italian cloth, usually for the lining of coats, and is about three inches by two. That's the patch uh, on it. So the reactions up in Horsef uh, are recorded with each day's suspense. Their sympathy with the Waterhouse family grew keener. And when on Thursday morning it became known that the parents of poor Barbara had been summoned to Leeds and what they had seen, irrepressible horror took possession of the villagers at the terrible crime. Had the murderer been in Horsef and known to the residents, he would have surely have been lynched. Large numbers of people assembled yesterday around the spot where the body was found, this is down in Leeds, and freely expressed their opinions of the murderer. One person thought that hanging's too good for him, while all expressed a desire to lay hands on the fiend. fiend. The curious thing is that no one appears to have met anyone carrying a bundle. And as the body was found only a short time after the public houses were closed, uh, it's extraordinary that no one should have seen the murderer. In fact, at 11.15 p.m. on Wednesday night, there were between 15 and 20 cyclists ascend, uh, assembled in front of a Victoria Hotel at the back of the town hall, while there must have been a few persons outside Wharton's Hotel, which is at the junction of Alexander Street and Park Lane, at about the same time. Moreover, the street sweepers uh, make their mighty rounds at that time, yet nothing was noticed. The general opinion here is in Horsef, uh, and the local police are confident that the crime has been committed not in Horsef, but in Leeds. A number of women selling fire papers were in the village on Saturday last, I presume these are sort of uh, uh, short broadsides uh, about, the, about the murder, and the place was also busy with Italian organ grinders, so I guess there was entertainment on the street in some way, and people could find a little bit of money out of this uh, murder that took place. The mother of a deceased is in a sad condition, owing to the sad blow that has fallen upon her family. She'd been suffering from fainting fits since she saw the body yesterday morning, and their conversation is said to be that of a rambling character. Every now and then she'll break up with some exclamation as, eh, hey, that man has murdered my bairn. The husband, too, has been in weak state of health for some time, and he has suffered to some extent from the shock. The father of the deceased is a man who is in very poor condition. He is, as already been stated, a quarryman, and at the best of time only earns 35 shillings a week. It was corrected in the earlier paper saying he just earned 15 shillings. Considering he's never worked full time since last Christmas, it will at once be seen that an affair like this, which was reported yesterday, has produced practically a financial crisis. But friends have flocked in on every hand since the trouble fell upon them and offered assistance in various ways. One of those uh, was the Reverend Pearson. He uh, had a couple of services up at St. Margaret's Church. They raised £14 and seven shillings. The Mr. Amis, who's the Wesleyan minister, is in guaranteeing the cost of the internment of the poor child. And it's opposed to make an appeal to congregations, other congregations of places of worship in Horsef. John Ridley of the Black Bull placed a sheet on the forecourt and a collection in the pub raised seven pounds, two shillings and ninepence. So if we're moving on to the sort of uh, uh, Saturday, and uh, this is now a uh, account coming about uh, the Turner family seen from their perspective of what's going on. So the really is the Waterhouse family have no idea what has, what has happened. Uh, and so we're rolling back to Saturday, the 6th of June, 1891, and coming into the uh, uh, starting off in the morning. I can say on that morning, the male prisoners who said Walter Louis uh, Turner rose early and went, as his mother thought, to his work in the usual place. So there were just two of them uh, that live there. There's uh, Mrs. Turner, or Mrs. Ann Turner. She's aged 58 uh, and lives with her son, Walter Turner. He's aged, uh, I think, that is recorded as being aged 31. So whether he had a birthday uh, in between here and the trial, but he's also recorded later on in August of, of this year as being aged 32. So perhaps he, he had a birthday. Because uh, they live in the former boot and shoe, which is just to the right of here, uh, opposite where the yoga cafe is today. It's now been uh, demolished. Uh, 
And this is a testimony that uh, Turner said. He said, I started to go to work as usual. He worked at Woodbottom Mill. I must also say that the family hadn't been here very long, the two of them. Uh, they had... Uh, uh, I can't quite work out whether they came uh, in March of the year, because sometimes they, the newspaper report says that uh, they've been here three months. And another one says is that they've only resided here since Whitsuntide, uh, which would mean that they've been here three weeks because Whitsuntide was earlier on in May of 1891. So he said, I started to go to work at Woodbottom Mill at six o'clock. I got part of the way there and then decided not to go, not being in a working humour. Besides not feeling so well, I turned back to Horseth, taking my time going through the fields. I went by the church, got into Town Street on my way home, but called in at the Black Bull first. So it must have opened about eight o'clock in the morning, uh, this pub, or earlier than, than that. Uh, Mrs. Waterhouse uh, left the house before seven o'clock in the morning, it is believed, with the intention of going to Leeds. Her reason for travelling so early was to avail herself of a cheaper fare charged for the workman's train, her means being of the most straitened character. Whether she actually visited Leeds or not, she returned home about half past nine, and to her astonishment, found her son there. Hello, she said, whatever are you doing here? I thought you were at work. He replied that he had met a friend and had gone for a pint of beer with him. His mother, seeing his condition, retorted that he had evidently had more than a pint. And he replied, well, to tell the exact truth, I had two pints. He then went upstairs to lie down, as his mother believed, uh, to sleep off the effects of the drink. Testimony here from now Mrs. Mary Ann Robinson. Uh, she lived further down Back Lane in one of the cottages, uh, I guess, round about where the art uh, studio is today. And uh, I think is that the Robinsons also owned the house uh, that the Turners were renting at the time. Uh, uh, but because uh, of the house where she lived, it's called Robinson Row. So whether this uh, they actually owned them or they're owned amongst the uh, the family, I'm not quite so sure. But all I know is that uh, Mary Ann Robinson uh, actually went and collected the rents uh, from the uh, Turners. Uh, her, her husband Abraham was a fettler in in a in a mill. She said she knew the female prisoner who rented a house which the witness had the letting of. About midday on June the 6th, Mrs Turner called to see about a cottage she wanted to take. She paid her rent. The, although there'd only been a short while in the uh, former boot and shoe, is that, I, I think I said before, is that the, I think it was very damp in there. And I think they took it on uh, with uh, uh, the uh, idea that, if one of the cottages came vacant lower down, which the Robinsons uh, had, is then they could move from the old boot and shoe into that cottage, uh, probably just below where Mrs. Robinson lived herself. And I think that was ag agreed upon, uh, maybe because of the state of, of that property. Could also The other reason it could, why they wanted to move, is that the a former boot and shoe was a, a bit of a larger uh, uh, cottage than the one they were going to move into. It said is that really they only had one large room downstairs and two upstairs bedrooms. And I think one of the properties just below the art club or the second one down from that is quite a small cottage there. The others tend to have uh, a, a couple of rooms upstairs uh, and downstairs as well. So perhaps it was uh, that one. And uh, so uh, she said she paid her rent as she was said she was going to Leeds and would not be back when Mrs. Turner to called in for the key. Mrs. Turner was told she had to take a. Uh, she was told she uh, had to go and see her brother about it. And I guess this is where the uh, cottages are owned by a wider Robinson family around there. And because uh, Mrs. Robinson said she saw her brother, uh, and on the Monday, June the eighth, Mrs. Turner uh, took the cottage, handing her the key. Excuse me, I'll just sneeze. <laughs> and said that she didn't see her towards the end of the week. They moved into the cottage uh, from one back lane, I guess at one back lane, either Whitton side or in March, and because they're not impressed with it uh, at all. Is that all we knew is that the, um, the, the one back lane uh, had two bedrooms upstairs. Uh, the one at the back, uh, which looks onto the back of Upper Bank House, uh, is the room that uh, uh, Turner lived, uh, slept in, and Mrs. Turner 
uh, slept in the bedroom overlooking Back Lane. And here we have uh, another testimony from uh, uh, Lewis Turner. Being in the mood for company, I spoke to him. So he's made, he's either made up this person because it was uh, called Jack, uh, who he said was from Pudsey or Farsley Way, uh, to give him sort of some corroborative uh, thing that he, he he had a story behind it, and I think uh, probably the more that he told the story to people, the more he believed it him, himself. And uh, so he said he'd uh, met this chap, Jack from Pudsey, uh, and uh, he said that at one instance, he said he met him in the Black Bull, uh, and where uh, Benjamin Stead, the landlord, said uh, he was alone, had a glass of beer, sat in a corner at the bar near the fireplace. And that's all he said of him when he came in in the morning. And now he's saying he's meeting this bloke and having a drink with him at lunchtime. So, uh, but he actually didn't meet him in the Black Bull at all. He says he asked him into his house. We shut the door, sat down by the fire and talked about things in general. In fact, we talked about nothing in particular. I also played a little for him. There was a piano in the room. And during the stay, we had some beer, Two pints, I think, but not more. I paying for it, he fetching it. So I either got it from uh, the Black Bull, which would be nearest, or from the Alma Inn, if that was open, or across the road from the Black Bull. No one ever saw this infamous Jack uh, going in for either twice for, to get separate pints or to bring back four pints, uh, which is probably more difficult unless he brought it back in a, a jug. And he said, where he fetched it from, I did not ask. As near as I can tell, it was about half past two when he left. Uh, we have no clock in the house. It's always kept in my mother's bedroom. He asked me if I could meet him anywhere at night. I said I could not promise as mother was away. I then told him I should go to bed again, having decided not to go out. He then left. I did not notice which way he went. So that was his alibi. And this Jack uh, was never found. So uh, moving on to this one here, sometimes afterwards, uh, again, uh, probably uh, uh, 10 o'clock or, or after that, uh, no, she went to pick up the key from Mrs. Robinson. So after that, Mrs. Turner left the leads. Before she went, she locked the door on the outside and put the key back through the window. A thing she had frequently done when she left her son alone in the house. Mrs. Turner remained in Leeds till evening, spending part of the day uh, at the house of her son-in-law, Mr. Thomas Joy. He's a, a deaf and mute man, aged 47. They lived in Crown Street. Crown Street still exists today. That's the White Cloth Hall. This area is gone because that's where the corn exchange now stands. This is a map from 1847. I've only chosen this one because it shows where they actually did live. Uh, according to the census here, they were here in 1891, uh, living at the rear of this building. There's a shop to the front here, but the living accommodation was at the back. And uh, can say uh, this is Call Lane over here. This has all been demolished now. It's where a, uh, a restaurant called Las Iguanas is. Can uh, say be uh, also uh, not marked on this map as well. Is that uh, part of this was then de uh, demolished with the coming of the dark arches coming across here as well. So that's where they came. Severing the White Cloth Hall in 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 part because of the cupola and the clock tower are still on that building there. So if you know where I'm talking about. Uh, and I think that was re-commercialised in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, uh, that bit was demolished. But all these properties down here still remain there. I think the White Swan is, uh, is renamed another bar there. So you can see roughly where the area is that, that they were living in. Uh, so the Joys uh, lived in that family, uh, in that house around there. Because uh, they lived at Two Crown Street, which is actually that property, uh, and uh, she, so Mrs. Turner went out there to shop with Mrs. Joy. Mrs. Joy is her daughter Jessie, uh, age thirty-three at the time. She's also deaf and mute. Uh, my uh, understanding would be from that is that they met at the Leeds Deaf and Dumb Institute because there was a bit of an age difference between them. Mr. Joy and his wife they had five children, aged aged from two to 12. And uh, Mrs. Turner also visited another friend during her sojourn to the town. She returned to Horsef in the evening, leaving Leeds about six o'clock, taking with her grandchild. This is Mrs. Joy's son, aged 12, called Joy. Uh, 
There is no doubt whatsoever that when they reached home, the cellar had already received its ghastly occupant. But nothing occurred either then or the next day to lead them to suspect a bundle of mangled humanity lay within a few yards of them. Had Mrs. Turner noticed then something she subsequently discovered, her suspicions might have been aroused. For though it has since apparently escaped observation, she has stated that she found a blood stain on the bedroom floor. The stain, she stated, had the appearance of having smeared over the boards of the floor with a foot. George Joy said his uncle did not go out of the house after his arrival about eight o'clock, but his grandmother went out to fetch some beer for the supper. His uncle drank the whole of it. There was a sheet, a blanket and quilt on the bedstep, uh, bedstead and he slept in the same bed as his uncle. So if we come on to the uh, boot and shoe, that's a picture of it. Uh, this is where the Turners uh, lived at that time. Another testimony here, but moving on to Sunday, uh, the day after uh, the murder has supposedly taken place, or some suspect that it didn't take place until Sunday evening. George Joy uh, then says, when he awoke the next morning, his uncle had gone. But when he went downstairs about 11 o'clock, his uncle was on the sofa. He had a rather a long lie in there. One significant occurrence, however, was noted alike by the old woman and the young lad. Uh, on the Sunday morning, Mrs. Turner, according to her usual practice, was about to get up to light the fire and asked her son if it was time to do so. He replied, can't I be allowed to light the fire? And she said, certainly, if you like. He then rose and lit the fire. A very unusual, if not a unique circumstance. He on the previous day filled a box of coals and brought it into the kitchen. Another thing which Turner was not accustomed to do. When Mrs. Turner came down to make the breakfast, she found that Turner placed the end of the sofa against the door of the coal closet, uh, which is on a level with the kitchen, and he scarcely ever left that sofa during the whole of the day. Some say it was a cellar, but I think the uh, coals were actually kept in a cupboard underneath the stairs. Uh, there were stone stairs that went up uh, to the uh, up to the bedrooms on the first floor. And so we have another testimony here from a man named John Walker, said to be a Sunday school teacher at Horsef. He visited uh, uh, the Turner household. He was aged 41. He was a cabinet maker on Town Street with a man, man named Watson. There were so many Watsons in Horsef. I have uh, been unable to discover just from his surname which Watson it would be. Uh, the latter was in the same ward at the LGI. Uh, some time ago, he said, uh, and uh, Turner had invited to visit him uh, when he was living in Horsef. And they visited the house on the Sunday afternoon for about 20 minutes, during the whole of which time Turkey re Turner remained seated on the sofa, having nothing whatsoever to say to Watson and answering Walker's questions in the few, fewest possible words. George Joy and Mrs. Turner had gone out to pick bluebells, I guess, up in Hunger Hills Woods or, or, or somewhere around. So that happened in that time they were missing. And I can say George Joy on getting home to Leeds remarked about his grandmother being very well, but his uncle seemed poorly. And here we have later on uh, during the evening uh, of, of I can say George had gone back home and Mr. and Mrs. Turner were in the house. This is testimony from uh, Richard Rathmull. He was the, a farmer. I think he's the one uh, that farms at Crag Farm at Crag Hill. He gave evidence of the sounds he heard in the direction of Turner's house on the green at nearly 12 o'clock on the Sunday night. I wonder whether he meant the Saturday night. I, say, I, have, I have no idea. He couldn't swear that the sounds came from the house, though, and so was uh, dismissed. But to James Jackson, grocer, whose shop is separated from the old boot and shoe by a yard. That's what we see here. There's a bit of a, a gate there, which still uh, is there today, although it's been embanked up the wall down here in the last uh, four years. Uh, but the gate still remains in exactly the same place. And that led into a yard behind the boot and shoe pub. And he stated he heard strange sounds proceeding either from Turner's house or from the yard as nearly at nearly midnight on the Sunday when the uh, 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 on the following day that the child had gone missing. He declared emphatically that no one connected with his business would be in that yard at that time. 
So let's move on to Monday, the 8th of June, 1891. And because they testimony here again the next morning at about 5.30 a.m., uh, Mrs. Turner spoke to a neighbour named Mrs. Galter. Mrs. Galter's age 21. The newspaper reports they must quite like her because she's a bright, intelligent, handsome young woman uh, who worked close to the male prisoner down at Woodbottom Mill. She has two sons aged two and seven months at the time. They too lived in Alma Yard in a shared house, so uh, a door but one away from the Waterhouse family, and told her to inform her daughter, uh, who was employed at the same mill as a prisoner, that the letter that the latter would not be going to work on the Monday as they were removing. So where they were moving to, as we can see further down here, is Robinson Row, which are these properties which still stand today. That's where the Art Society is. So I took this picture on that lovely day, uh, not today, but the day before. Uh, and so I suspect is that the, uh, they were moving into perhaps this cottage here, uh, which is a very small one there, or there's another very small one just in there. But the, uh, I gather from when I've looked at these sort of maps around here, the whole lot is called Robinson Row along there. And uh, so, so Mrs. Um, Turner goes to Mrs. Robinson uh, to get the key to the cottage at 9 a.m. And here's testimony from Thomas Myers, age 54. He's a drayman. Uh, is, well, it's not a, uh, I'd say he's more of a delivery man. It is employed by the confectioner, Mr. Poynton. We've mentioned him before. And that uh, he lives on Back Lane as well. Although uh, when we checked on the census, actually lives at Prospect Place, which is uh, nearby anyway, and said he knew both the Turners. And early on the morning of the mo uh, Monday the 8th, he saw them both leave the old house. The male prisoner carrying one large bundle and the female prisoner carrying a small bundle in each arm. They went down back lane in the direction of the residence they were moving to. The large bundle was wrapped in some light coloured material. Although the removing didn't seem to have taken place until three o'clock and afterwards, because uh, the second house was a plain one, as they say here, having only three rooms with a coal cellar at the bottom. And uh, say, we've got testimony here from Robert uh, Everson. The Everson family live on Robinson Row as well, but in the census is actually visiting, I suspect, his grandparents uh, who live at the Arcade on Town Street uh, because he's aged uh, 15, although in the newspaper reports it says he's actually age 13. He said that he saw Turner in Back Lane on the 8th. He asked him to help him remove some furniture and he consented and went into the house. This is the old boot and shoe. When he got into the front bedroom, Turner pointing to a box said, take hold of the handle and lift it carefully. They then took the box downstairs, placed it on a cart outside and took it to the house to which the prisoners were removing. When they arrived, Turner asked him to put it down carefully. This is on the outside. Mrs. Turner was in the new home when they got there and saw uh, the, uh, Turner the Younger take the box into the house. The box was the same one as the one producing court uh, that was found at the Midland Railway Station, which we'll learn about us later on. It would seem that until m uh, Monday morning, Mrs. Turner remained in ignorance and surely in blissful ignorance of the grim transaction. It was then under circumstances the most appalling that she discovered what was in the coal closet. And her discovery was the first link in the chain of dark events that have buried, hurried her into a prison cell. Whether or not she was astir on Monday morning before her son awoke, she lit the fire herself. It was a want to prepare her son some breakfast before he went to his work. She had come downstairs only partially dressed, intending to complete a toilet afterwards. Going into the cellar for some coals, she saw a bundle that she had not previously noticed. She felt it with her hand and mentally shrank back in a fright. That single touch would seem to have revealed to her the ghastly nature of its contents. And screaming aloud, she rushed upstairs. Her intention was to get her clothes on and run into the street to raise alarm. But the intention was never carried out. For before she got out of the room, she was grasped by her son and held tightly. Then it was, to all appearance, he told her the loathsome secret. Then, too, it would seem, it was the maternal affection mastered alike her natural impulse and her prudence. It will be seen yet more clearly, however, how deep and unselfish a love she bears for her son. 
that love it was that prompted her to screen him at all hazards and that sharing as she did his guilty secret made her an accessory after the fact. So this is uh, Turner's uh, version of the crime that Jack did it. Uh, so Mrs. Turner has protested all, uh, all along, uh, protested her son's innocence and he in turn has denied any participation in the crime. His story that on Saturday after his mother left, he and a man he calls Jack went out and had some drink together and he at any rate returned home in an intoxicated condition and went to sleep. When he woke, he says he found Jack had gone and had left the body of the murder girl wrapped in a bundle behind. This story has told to his mother and is also stated to the family, the Joys, his sister uh, that lives down in Leeds. Not really much happened on Tuesday, the 9th of June, 1891. Uh, Christina Sutcliffe, the daughter of Jonas Sutcliffe, who's a, a carrier uh, from horses, stated that Mrs. Turner went to her house and said that she wanted a parcel count to Mrs. Cottrell's house at Portland Crescent in Leeds. We'll meet the Cottrells a little later on. She told Mrs. Turner they could not take the parcel and the female prisoner then went on her way. So, excuse me. Let's move to Wednesday, the 10th of June. And you can say whoever was guilty of the actual crime, the terrible evidence of it remained in that house in Back Lane, Horseth, until Wednesday of last week. And mother and son were practically imprisoned with it. On Wednesday, the day of which they were to remove and did partly remove to Town Street, it says they were wrongly, but onto further down Back Lane, uh, is that uh, they disposed of the body in the manner already recorded. But before that time, the decomposition of the remains threatened to expose the secret. And Mrs. Turner was obliged to obtain some chloride of lime. This came from a shop called Kirk's on Town Street to neutralise the stench. By Wednesday evening, I'd say afternoon, uh, the two prisoners had got the bulk of their furniture removed. A piano, the property of the son, who can play fairly well on the instrument, and some heavy other heavy articles uh, were allowed to remain in the old house for lack of means to pay for a cart to convey them. And they remain in the Back Lane house yet. In the evening, I say uh, afternoon, having first placed a bundle in the now infamous box, Mrs. Turner has some brought the body to Leeds by the 5.33 p.m. train. On arriving at the Midland station, they conveyed their burden to Mrs. Joy's house in Crown Street. And here's testimony from Sarah Oldroyd, who also lives in Back Lane, stated that she saw both the prisoners coming out of their own house on Wednesday, carrying a large box. The box produced was the same colour as the one she saw her two the two prisoners carrying. She did not know whether the box lid was secured by a cord or not because that was part of it. It was uh, a string was wrapped around the, uh, this tin box. And here we have testimony from William Bradley, a striker of Crag Hill, said he was returning from work at 4.45 p.m. on Wednesday the 10th of June. He saw the Turners going towards Newley Station. They had a tin box. The mother held it with her left hand and the son with his right. The box produced was the same that they had with them. Another testimony here from Elizabeth Smith of Summersgill Square, Horseth. She said she saw a female prisoner on the afternoon about 100 yards from Newley Station carrying a box with the assistance of a man in the direction of the station. Mrs Turner seemed very fatigued. And here we have another testimony of Richard Atkinson. He was aged 61. Uh, he lived in Kirk Street, Kirksall. He deposed that he journeyed by train from Apley Bridge to Kirksall on that Wednesday afternoon, and the two prisoners travelled in the same compartment as himself from Newley. He did not notice that they had any luggage. But we find a testimony from William Smith. The goods guard said that the box uh, was put in the brake van at the station by a man and a woman got into the same compartment as the man that brought the box. On arrival at Leeds, the box was put out of the train along with other luggage. The box produced was like the one put into his van at Newley. So they're progressing uh, to his uh, son-in-law's house on Crown Street. Uh, Mr. Joy is a bookbinder by trade and his wife has spoken of by all who know them as being most worthy, respectable, <laughs> excuse me, people. Mrs. Joy is, of course, Mrs. Turner's daughter. And before removing to Horsa, the two prisoners used to occupy some rooms in the same house as Mrs. Joy, which rooms have since been empty. On arriving at Crown Street, they asked Mr. Joy to allow them to place a tin box in his workshop. 
which is a few yards away from the house at the bottom of the end of White Swan Yard. So we see where the house was at the front and where, because they're only uh, a, a few paces away, I guess, really. He, in ignorance of the contents, readily consented, and they took it to the shops themselves, uh, to the shop themselves. Mr Joy did not go with them because the mother knew the shop pretty well. And his testimony of Thomas Joy, the two prisoners went into his shop in White uh, Swan Yard on the 10th of June with a box like the one produced. There was some conversation between the two prisoners, but he did not know what was said. Mrs. Turner went away first, and when she had gone, a man called Connor went into the shop. He had a dog, and the dog ran around rather excitedly. And uh, Connor uh, remained about 15 or 20 minutes in his workshop. A little later, they returned and had some summer, supper, after which Mrs. Turner went and paid a visit to some friends. A visit was to be the means, ultimately, of a, de a detection of her son and herself. She was, she was going to see her friends called the Cotterills. Uh, they live on Portland Crescent. Uh, I think Portland Crescent still exists. If we're going to look at this map uh, here, uh, that's the LGI uh, building over there. Uh, this is the Mechanics, uh, sorry, the Mechanics Institute is there. That's the O2 Academy. And now the Civic, uh, Civic City Hall, is it? The Civic Hall stands in this area around there. This was sort of all sort of built up. Uh, I think some of these properties still exist. Uh, I guess I've got a photograph a little later on of some of the properties that stood there until they were demolished in the 1960s. So I guess uh, the uh, city Civic Hall stands, uh, stands in this area here and left those houses there uh, 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 erected. I'm not sure which property they are, uh, they're on, but on the census, uh, you need to find out. Somebody else who lives on the street to know if he went up and down or he zigzagged across the road. But uh, that's where Portland Crescent sits, so right in the city centre. So basically, she walked from uh, the old White Cloth Hall right across the city centre uh, to uh, Portland Crescent. Because uh, they've, uh, they've been uh, friends with her and because uh, they, uh, uh, they live at 91 Portland Crescent. They've known her for 17 years. They have a family of five children as well, aged from six uh, to 19. Mrs. Uh, Turner was a bit of a dressmaker and their 19 year old daughter was a dressmaker as well. So perhaps uh, uh, she often went down there to, uh, to help her out. So she had reached the Joys about seven o'clock and was off to the Cotterills about eight o'clock. Uh, and uh, say Mr Cotterill, he's uh, John Cotterill, he's aged 45, um, but it wasn't in that evening. He'd actually come up to Horsa for, for some reason and that's he called in at the old boot and shoe, uh, found nobody in there and kept uh, on with his... Uh, uh, with whatever he was doing in Horsef, uh, because but he'd heard about the murder because he heard the evening paper boys uh, shouting out mysterious affair at Horsef, and that was the first he'd ever heard of the matter. On reaching home, Mrs. Turner was there and had already uh, related a dreadful story uh, to his wife. So basically, he returns back from Horsef down to his uh, wife on Portland Crescent. Mrs. Turner had already spilled the beans to Mrs. Cotterill. And uh, I say, uh, Mary Cotterill, she was age 45. Uh, Mrs. Turner, when she turned up, said she was in trouble. And when the witness asked her what was the matter, Mrs. Turner replied, you'll know soon enough. And uh, say, when the murder of the missing girl was mentioned, so she said there is nothing less than murder in our house. Mrs. Turner further stated that her son had not committed the murder, but that it was perpetrated by a man with whom she, he had been drinking and by whom the bundle was left by the side of the male prisoner while he was asleep in, in the house. She asked where the murder had been committed and she replied that she didn't know, but there was a little mark on the bedroom floor. Uh, and so Mr. Uh, uh, Cottrell's advice uh, when he returned was that uh, she should go and inform the police herself. Uh, and if she didn't inform the police, he would. And about a quarter to nine, uh, Mrs. Uh, Turner left the Cottrell's house, promising that she would go at once uh, and take the body to the police station and disclose everything. 
Mr Cofferill afterwards regretted that he did not himself accompany her there direct. And as we'll see, uh, see and see, his regret was not uh, groundless. You see, from their house here to the police station at that time was in the town hall, uh, whereas the mortuary and, and other things were uh, uh, else on, on Milgar Street. But uh, on leaving the Cotterills, uh, Mrs Turner retur returned to the Joy's uh, house. George Joy, who had come out to spend the night with him on the Saturday night, uh, asked what was in that box. And uh, Turner said it contained his Sunday clothes. And uh, cause they, they remained there together, um, mother and son, until 11 o'clock. And uh, I think they probably discussed what they were going to do after she'd been to Mrs. Cottrell's. And I think that he was very, very angry uh, that she had told uh, Mrs. Cottrell all about it. And uh, so they uh, seems that uh, uh, they sort of left the house on, on that day, uh, leaving the tin box uh, behind uh, in one of the empty rooms that they'd formerly slept in uh, when they were there. Uh, but they were overheard by the Joys, or probably family, uh, because they were deaf and dumb, so they probably wouldn't have heard anything at all. And uh, say they, uh, somebody, their children heard them talking in a loud tone in a very excited manner. Uh, but at 11 o'clock, they went out together carrying the box. Uh, testimony here from Mr Joy. The two prisoners and George left the house about 10 o'clock, so the young lad did go with them, taking the uh, key of the shop door with them. About 20 minutes after they returned, he saw the box in the house, but he didn't want to touch it. The two prisoners left his house that night a little before midnight. Mrs. Turner wanted to give him the box a little before 12 o'clock, but he told them that he didn't want anything to do with it and asked the prisoners to take it away. He found the box in the same place the following morning and took it into a passage leading into one of the bedrooms. The box wasn't heavy, he said, and he did not try to open it. So that's what sort of happened on the sort of the uh, uh, when, when they went uh, down there to visit on the Wednesday. And uh, but we see that uh, something else uh, happened there is then. Uh, so that was a tin box. They'd gone out with it about 11 o'clock and returned about 12 o'clock. Uh, but this is what happened between sort of 11 and 12 o'clock is that uh, they were intending. Uh, I think Mrs. Turner convinced her son is that they ought to take the body and confess to the crime, especially if he didn't did it and this Jack bloke Jack did it. So they're heading from Crown Street up to the town hall where the police station was. And, uh, but it seems what happened is that it got cold feet uh, when they reached that place and decided that they're going to deposit the body somewhere. And they chose Alexander Street, uh, where it's afterwards found by the police officer. Uh, she said they went all the way round by unfrequented streets and back lanes. Uh, and you could say that, uh, but at one part of this, they had to go up Park Row. Uh, and, uh, but you could say they didn't see anybody at all, or they kept to the shadows, I, I guess. And you could say uh, they then left the body. So they took the body out of the uh, tin trunk and left it in that gateway on Alexander uh, Street. And then they returned. Uh, taking the tin trunk back to the joys. I think the joys have probably had enough of these two and the sort of ins and outs and this tin trunk and things like that and putting it in the workshop. I think that's why they had to go. And so they returned to the, uh, the tin box back to the joys about 11.30, uh, remained there a little while longer. And then uh, say they uh, then left and uh, they were, as Turner said, they missed the last train and had to walk home. And uh, could say witness had had charge of the Turner's house since there was only bedding for one bed. I, I don't know what that means, but uh, but an interesting fact here is that as so we were turning, I guess perhaps uh, I think it sounds like we're coming up Fink Hill. But if you lived on Back Lane, you wouldn't come up Fink Hill unless this was on Featherbank Lane or something. Uh, as they were passing through the main street of the village, and so I think it's wrong, a singular coincidence occurred. At one part of the road, the footpath follows a bend or a curve in a high wall, and for that time it is in deep shadow. Though they were making no attempt at concealment, it happened, single enough that whilst, sorry, a mounted police constable rode past without observing them. That officer was Superintendent Stansfield Groom. I think he was the PC mentioned earlier that had been sent out uh, from there to go up to Horses uh, Police Station to say that they'd found a body. Uh, 
And uh, say, and it was a remarkable circumstance that the Turners should not have reached home after the accomplishment of their terrible errand. So they knew and returned back, but the water houses didn't know that they were about to find out what had happened. And they went to their house. So if we look on to the next one here, this is Alexander Street. Oddly enough, I took this black and white photograph in 1983 and knew exactly where, where it was. So uh, much a uh, uh, coincidence. <clears throat> but the problem was is that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cottrell had uh, spent an anxious night and probably couldn't sleep. And uh, they were uh, expecting to read about the discovery of the body in the next morning's papers, and that would be all over. And because they, they uh, were very disappointed to learn that, because uh, they, uh, that they probably hadn't gone to inform the police, and nothing had been published in that morning's paper. And so Mr. Cottrell was uh, unnaturally, uh, naturally unwilling to have his name mixed up with the affair. Uh, in the census of April 1891, he described himself as a private waiter, uh, whatever that means. So whether uh, he did errands on behalf of, of people, I, I, I've, I've no idea. Uh, and he was determined that the police should not remain in ignorance of the part played by the Turners in the foul transaction. Both himself and his wife were moreover unable to bear the strain and torment any longer and to acquaint the police authorities with what had transpired an anonymous letter uh, offered the easiest means of achieving his purpose. And he determined to adopt the course, uh, proceeding with caution, using a printed Perth Dye Works circular as note paper, and he wrote the following message. The inspector, Horse of Police Station, charge Walter Louis Turner of Back Lane Horse of with that crime. He will convict himself at once. He didn't post it in Leeds. He had uh, some work to do out at Chapel Town and posted it there because I think he ended up with a Chapel Town postmark uh, out there at, at that time. So because it'd be quite hard to trace uh, who wrote that letter uh, from that area as well. The post of police uh, received the communication by the first post on Friday morning. And uh, could say, but they didn't seem to. They seemed to take their while. I guess they probably thought it was a crank uh, letter or something like that, because people do this uh, type of thing. I think they'd had a number of other people sort of come forward and saying they'd seen the child, they'd seen it in uh, Horsef Railway Station, they'd seen a child, and so obviously it took rather a lot of time up. And they didn't act on this until three o'clock in the afternoon. And could say the. Uh, uh, the conduct of the male prisoner when the police went up to arrest him would have been borne out to some extent by the prophecy of the anonymous letter. The Turner immediately rushed upstairs and when secured, he said, you will have it to prove. So, uh, because they've now got this sort of confession and how it turned about, I could say the, uh, um, but still there was nothing in the, because uh, that's a uh, uh, Portland uh, uh, Crescent, uh, that is, that stood there. I was sorry, for short to show you that uh, before. And this is the uh, Cotterills. Um, I just need to blow my nose again. Um, let me see where we are. Uh, so we've got testimony from Mr. Joy on Friday, the 12th of June. Uh, uh, say, said Mrs. Turner went into his shop and offered uh, to take the box away. So she returned back to Leeds and asked for a duster with which to clean it. When she cleaned the box, she put the duster into the fire. The witness then went out to work and did not see her again until three o'clock uh, when Mr. Cottrell and Mrs. Turner were at the same house. So they'd anticipated a, a, a arrest of, of Turner being uh, being immediate uh, and things like that. Uh, and uh, so really the, uh, uh, um, uh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just skip over a bit to shorten this down. Um, you say she knew the Cottrells, and she'd known them for 15 years, and uh, uh, but uh, they state that she was born in Leicester uh, and uh, said that she'd also lived in uh, Nottingham many years ago and that many of Mrs. Turner's relatives still lived in Leicester and are of people in comfortable circumstances. But Mrs. Turner had uh, been entirely dependent upon her son and they have been in very straitened circumstances. She, far as she was concerned, this is Mary Cottrell, uh, was that uh, uh, it wasn't necessary at all, as both her own and her husband's relatives would have been very glad to take her in to live with them. We could say, poor woman, she persisted in remaining with her son. Uh, 
uh, and they can say uh, they've moved around quite a lot for the, the past several years until three months ago, as she said, although it meant three weeks, is that uh, they went to live in Horsa. Uh, the Joys have lived in Crown Street for two years, and I say they, for the majority of that time, Mrs. Turner and the son have lived with them uh, uh, as well. And uh, so after the, uh, uh, ha what happened up in Horsef was that the police uh, were making house to house inquiries. They wanted to know who lived in the house and whether they had any lodgers or visitors that had come into the house. So they went round house by house. And uh, so on that Friday afternoon, I guess is it made a beeline uh, down to one back lane uh, to see what was going on because police sergeant Poyser uh, was there as well as police constable Croskery. They reached the house occupied by Turner and his mother in Back Lane. The officers knocked on the door several times, but received no response. They knew, however, that Sergeant Poyser, uh, that uh, someone was in the house because they heard footsteps on the stone staircase inside. Sergeant Poyser then tried to open the door, which happened to be unlocked, and the officers entered the house. They shouted upstairs that they wanted to know who lived in the house. Turner came to the bedroom door and descended the steps. But when he saw the policeman, he began to tremble from head to foot. His knees shook, his hands trembled, and he appeared to be in an excited and nervous condition. Sergeant Poise immediately suspected that Turner had something to do with the murder. But having obtained an answer to the question, the officers uh, left the house. On getting outside, they considered the matter, most unusual this is, and Sergeant Poyser decided to arrest the man on a charge of murder. The constables again entered the house and found Turner had retired back to his bedroom. They went upstairs and saw him with an evening newspaper in his hands containing an account of the murder, and several newspapers were found in the room which had published full details of the finding of the little girl's body and the steps which had been taken to track the murderer. Sergeant Poyser at once uh, charged Turner with committing the murder of the girl. And they could say, uh, Turner replied that he would have to prove it. And Sergeant Poyser rejoined that he would, at any rate, apprehend him on suspicion of having committed the crime. Sergeant Poyser then took Turner into custody and walked him to the central police station, for the, sorry, conveyed him to the central police station uh, down in Leeds in Park Street, where he was locked up. In the meantime, PC Croskery uh, was left to look after the house, the door of which had been locked and the key taken to the house down to Mrs. Neighbour, who lived further down where I mentioned it. And uh, like I say, while the police constables uh, was there, Mrs. Turner uh, turned up. Whether her suspicions were aroused uh, by the sight of the officer is not known, but her subsequent proceedings appear to show a guilty knowledge of the facts in connection with a dreadful tragedy. She asked Mrs. Robinson if she had seen Mrs. Turner's son, uh, say, and uh, she said that uh, uh, she hadn't, uh, and because he hadn't been, really been out of the house since he'd uh, been down, down there as well. And she says uh, uh, to that effect, and uh, say we have testimony there from uh, that Mrs. Turner called about 6.15, uh, to, this is to be Inspector Lee, she was alone. He found her in the key room. She'd gone down to Leeds again uh, uh, because she had decided that as her son had now been uh, appre apprehended for the murder, I guess she felt some guilt and that she should make a clean breast of it. And so she returned back down to Leeds to say that she only just come out of Leeds again. Uh, she was alone, uh, says the PC Sowerby in the town hall. He found her in the key room, uh, whatever that meant. Because uh, she stated on Monday previous, she went into her coal house and found a bundle wrapped in a shawl. Her statement was disjointed. She was crying and consequently he could not remember every single word. He, uh, he asked her if the shawl was missing and she could know it again. She said yes. He sent for the shawl, which was brought in by Sergeant Mackenzie. Mrs. Turner identified it as her property. After the statement, he and Mrs. Turner went to the Midland Station, where they found the tin box I'm gonna say, near a seat at number two platform. The Midland Station is uh, where the uh, city station is, is today. They went around Alexander Street, and when she got a few yards from the gate where the body was found, Mrs. Turner said, why, that's the gate. My son put the bundle out of the box there. I walked onto the street end. He joined me. And they could say she was then charged at 12.15 a.m. as being an accessory after the fact. 
there it was no doubt i think she said that it was done on saturday i have no hesit hesitation in saying so though i know no more about it than any of you so that was on friday the 12th of june uh, i don't know i got that saturday uh, the 13th of june uh, is that uh, say poor barbara uh, waterhouse uh, was buried in um, Horses Cemetery, and that's her grave down there. Barbara Whittam, daughter of D uh, David and Elizabeth Waterhouse of Horses, who was murdered uh, on or about June the 6th, 1891, aged five years. He shall uh, carry the lamb, uh, lambs in his bosom, it says after that, because they, uh, on the plinth below that, it says it was raised by public uh, subscription. Uh, if you know Horses Cemetery, uh, the main path uh, down from the uh, from the chapels of rest, uh, it's be going. Uh, if you're looking down here, uh, back over here, this is the wall to the college grounds, uh, and so we've got one row of rather large graves on the right hand side uh, by the main path, and it just stands behind that. It's got a cross on top of there. There are very few uh, graves in that area with crosses on. There might just be one other, so it is relatively easy uh, to find. Uh, there's a, uh, a Commonwealth War War one grave uh, just next to it as well, so it is uh, easy to find if you're ever in there. But down in Leeds uh, Town Hall in the courtroom uh, on that same day, the Saturday, they were brought before uh, uh, Magistrate Mr. Wilkinson and uh, say Mrs. Turner, of course, passed the night at the cells of the town hall and a little before 11, she was brought to the borough magistrate and charged with an accessory to the murder of Barbara Whittam Waterhouse. Reports that the mother had a worn and dejected appearance. It seems that she had had a bad night. At seven o'clock on the Saturday morning, she was removed from one cell into another. And both before and after that time, she was observed to be repeatedly lie down as though trying to get some sleep. She did not succeed in doing so, however. The male prisoner, on the other hand, presented a cool and collected appearance. On entering the room, he gave a quick glance around and seemingly took everything in. But except for this, there was little animation in his eyes. Walter Louis Turner is a sparsely built man, below the middle height. His complexion is decidedly sallow. One's attention is at once attracted to his face. Uh, rather surprising there. The most striking feature of which is his expansive forehead. Receding, it does at the top, it is somewhat similar to that of Peace. This is a chap called Charles Peace. He was aged 46 and hung at Armley uh, on the 25th of February, 1879. He shot a policeman in Manchester and he shot someone uh, also down in London, uh, but he was actually apprehended in Sheffield. So he's got really nothing at all to, to do with Leeds at all or, and why he was hung at Armley, I have no idea. Uh, and you can say there is, uh, describing Turner still, there's considerable breadth between the eyes, but the chin is very narrow and the bottom part of his face is therefore wedge shape. They both pleaded not guilty and they were remanded until today, uh, which is Friday. Uh, I guess that's the uh, the following Friday, uh, the 26th of June. But it was found out that Turner had a previous history. It attempted the murder of his wife in Shipley. And in the autumn of 1888, Turner created somewhat uh, a sensation in Saltaire and Shipley by cutting his wife's throat. The facts of the case seem to be that both parties have been married some years. Turner married Ellen Hainsworth in 1882. Mrs. Turner taught her husband to weave and he gained employment with her at Saltaire Mills. But his drinking habits, all tight as salt, wouldn't have been happy at all. And general neglect of work caused the wife to insist on a separation. That was the nearest you could get to in those days to a, to a divorce. And for about eight months, they lived apart. Then Turner returned to Shipley and his promises of amendment led to his wife agreeing to his living with her again. He obtained work at Mrs. Uh, Messrs. We Weatherhead's mill and for a time seemed to get into a better way. But he soon neglected his work and came home pr drunk pretty nearly every night. His wife protested that she would not have him in the house in such a condition. And as a matter of fact, she refused to sleep with him, making a couch for herself on chairs while he occupied the bed generally sleeping with his clothes on. On Saturday night, August the 17th, 1889, between 11 and 12 o'clock, he returned home as usual in a state of intoxication. Uh, 
though it stated that he remarked to his wife in the course of some talk, probably an argument I guess, that he would cut her throat, he was no worse than she had frequently seen him. They retired to rest, he in bed, she on the chairs, and nothing further occurred until about seven o'clock on a Sunday morning, when the wife was aroused out of her sleep by feeling her husband cutting her throat. He was dressed all but his, in his, but his coat and had a large pocket knife in his hand, and with this he was deliberately cutting his wife's throat. She seized him by the wrist and asked, Louis, what are you doing? He looked at her and disengaging his hand replied, what have I done? He then coolly put on his coat and went to the door. As he opened the door and was leaving, he was met by Mrs. Turner's widowed sister, who resides next door, and heard her sister's screams. She said to Turner, what have you been doing to, the, to our lass? He replied, nay, I've done nothing. She turned me out, that's all, and I'm going. Mr. Th uh, Thornton, the surgeon, Shipley, spoke at the trial and found that the neck had been cut uh, from a little below the, the left ear to with an inch of the point of the chin. The cut was a clean one and extended through the skin about a quarter of an inch. He was sentenced to nine months with hard labour, commuted just to six months as had been in jail three months already. So we're looking now at the inquest, so going back to... Uh, um, the town hall, and this took place in the courtroom here, but pictured on Friday the 26th of June 1891. And the report goes, shortly be, uh, after 11 o'clock, the two prisoners were ushered into the magistrate's room and conducted to two chairs, which had been placed in the centre of the floor for them. Immediately upon entering, the male prisoner caught sight of his solicitor, nodded at him, took a hasty glance around the room, then sat down and gazed through the window at the crowd which had assembled in the street. That's why the windows were, were, were to this side here. Uh, and uh, just say his appearance has changed little since we last uh, saw him before the magistrate. And he appeared to have little regard for the proceedings uh, from beginning to end. The female prisoner seemed to feel the position much more keenly than her son. Mrs. Waterhouse said, said she'd been seen the two, uh, two Turners, but she could not say that she knew them. Both Turners have visited the house next door, but one to her. This is the Goltiers. Uh, that's where the uh, the wife there, the one that was extremely pretty, who worked down at Wood uh, uh, Wood, uh, Wood Bottom Mills, uh, lived. And so that's how she had caught sight of her. Mrs. Uh, Joy, the her daughter, uh, who was deaf and dumb, gave evidence through Mr. Morton of Leeds, uh, of Leeds Deaf and Dumb Institute. And uh, she is described as an intelligent looking woman, answered the questions put to her without any hesitation. Her evidence was rather startling and created some sensation. The little lad, that's George Joy, was quite cool and relied on the question and replied to the questions without hesitation. It was then adjourned and restarted on Monday the 29th of June at two o'clock in the afternoon. I can say the proceedings then uh, were only brief and I can say again is that uh, uh, Turner just looked out of the window for most of the time and Mrs Turner's uh, face was drawn and the deep lines strongly marked. The closing of the summing up, the foreman of the jury stated that he, they were satisfied with the evidence that had been submitted submitted. The jury then retired and after an interval of 20 minutes they returned and the foreman read the following verdict. We found that Barbara Waterhouse met her death from violence. It is our opinion that she was murdered by Walter Lewis Turner who we find guilty of willful murder. We find Anne Turner, the mother, guilty of being an accessory after the fact. The prisoners were then remanded till Tuesday next and were removed to the cells. Uh, the Tuesday next, they were remanded again till the following Monday, uh, now the 6th of July. Because uh, uh, that uh, admission was by ticket only. The uh, prisoners were removed at 5 a.m. from their cells, and consequently the crowd of uh, people who were outside uh, failed to see the prisoners at all. Because the trial continued Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, and when the paper reported, the interest in the case is dying out and the corridors are comparatively free of visitors. But on Wednesday afternoon, they were both charged. Walter Turner then said, I am not guilty. The evidence of the whole 40 witnesses had been read over uh, and the magistrates retired. And on the return, uh, they had to stand up, the chairman addressing them, read over the charge which was so committed. And they say Walter was charged with murder and the female prisoner 
with being murder and being accessory after the fact. When asked if I had anything to say in reply, the male prisoner said in a husky voice, I'm not guilty. And the female prisoner said the same reply, but probably not in that voice. Uh, I can say the trial properly started. Uh, I can say this was uh, Saturday, the 25th of July, uh, 1891, and then uh, moved to the Thursday, the 30th of July at 10.30 in the morning. Mrs. Turner was tried first. The ladies' gallery and the space allotted to the general public were well filled and the body of the court was densely packed. The male prisoner once sat down in the chair provided for him in the centre of a dock, his mother seating herself on his left. The male prisoner folded his arms and sat looking straight before him while his mother's eyes were downcast. It was agreed to try them separately and Turner then had to leave the dock to the cells below. And like I say, uh, the case went on about what I've repeated already. But at half past 12, uh, Mrs. Waterhouse retired, uh, uh, came into court attired in deepest mourning and bearing traces on her face of mental suffering uh, and entered the business, uh, entered the witness uh, box. And it seems so that uh, the, uh, for reasons unknown, the rest of the story doesn't appear in the Wharfdale Observer. Uh, so whether a compositor had made a mistake is because there's nothing in the following column. It went on to another story. Uh, but uh, yet we learn that she was sentenced to one year's imprisonment. Uh, but the, uh, like I say, we found the prisoner guilty of the capital charge is that we read uh, because, like I say, the uh, the trial of and uh, commitment of uh, uh, Turner himself wasn't reported uh, in the Wharfdale Observer, nor was it uh, published in the Yorkshire Evening Post either. So, which is I found very, uh, uh, very strange. Uh, but to say the jury retired for 15 minutes, uh, the foreman returned. This is the case of uh, uh, Walter Turner. We find the prisoner guilty of the capital charge. The judge put on his black cap to announce the death sentence, then added, had those people in whose midst the crime was committed got hold of you, you would have met your death at their hands. And perhaps that fate might have been her fate, uh, uh, referring to Mrs. Turner, as well. And that was basically saying the feeling was so uh, outraged in horse of, is that a, a mob would have lynched him if they knew who it was. Turner was then asking if he had anything to say why the sentence of death should not be passed. He scratched his head and replied, I should like to say a, a few words if you'll let me. I wish to assert my innocence, as I've always done, as I shall always say so. Some of the witnesses can testify to my fondness for children, which would prevent me from doing such a thing as this. I shall always say I'm innocent. Because say he was sentenced to death, cheers broke out in the gallery, and the prisoner received the sentence with apparent indifference and walked coolly below. So we forward now to uh, his sentence of death on Tuesday, the 18th of August, 1891, at Armley Jail. Say the day before, uh, he was visited uh, by his sister, Mrs. Joy, with her husband. I guess they must have gone along with the uh, uh, deaf and, and dumb uh, chap from the uh, uh, Institute as, as well. Uh, so that's uh, his last visitors, and obviously didn't see his mother ever again. And it uh, then reads, with the execution of Walter Lewis Turner Armley Jail on Tuesday morning was closed the last chapter of a painful, tragic story. If you note, is that really this is sort of happening uh, just uh, 10 weeks, really, after it actually committed the, uh, the murder. And today, that, uh, I guess, would never happen. It would be spun out for 20 or 30 years, as it probably does on death row uh, in, in, in America Day. It was uh, thought in many quarters that uh, when he found there was no possibility of saving his life, he would make a full confession of his complicity in the crime. This expectation was not realised, for with that coolness amounting to callousness, which he displayed from the moment he was arrested, he stepped upon the scaffold without hardly, uh, scarcely uttered or written a single word, implying an admission that he did anything more than dispose of the body after it being surreptitiously brought into his house. Indeed, indeed, he is asserted his innocence to the last. Tuesday, the 18th of August, was a gloomy morning. Uh, Turner slept well during the night and partook of a hearty breakfast. And early in the morning was visited by the prison by the Reverend Dr. Boland, the Protestant chaplain. Billington, the executioner, 
Uh, I think he arrived from Farnham the, the night before because uh, they entered the cell shortly before eight o'clock and prepared the culprit for the doom which awaited him. Turner offered no resistance to the pinion process and walked firmly in the solemn procession to the scaffold shed, which is uh, a very short uh, distance of a condemned cell. Previous executions had taken place in the treadmill house, but the building in which Turner was hung is a new structure built specially for the purpose of executions and used on Tuesday for the first time. On the arrival of the procession within the building, the rope was adjusted around Turner's neck. The unhappy man submitted quietly to this operation, but when the executioner was about to pull the white cap over his face, he said, I don't want that, but it was put on him anyway. A minute before the clock struck eight, the hoisting of a black flag overhead announced the outside, to the outside world that Turner had answered with his life for the life of his innocent victim, because there was a cheer that went up for those people outside the jail. Billington had allowed an eight foot drop and death was instantaneous. Uh, I'm going to say a reporter or somebody there, uh, uh, the eyewitness account says, on a raised bench, uh, this was about an hour later because they're always left to hang uh, for an hour on the gallows. On a raised bench lay the remains of Turner, dressed in the grey suit he'd worn at his trial and covered with a prison rug. His eyes were partly open and his face was a peculiar livid hue, the mark of a rope on his neck. A plain wooden coffin was on the floor and the body was afterwards buried in a grave by the mortuary. It doesn't really end there, uh, because surprisingly, uh, reading ahead in 1892 on the, in the paper, uh, Friday the 5th of February, uh, the Wharfdale re, uh, Observer uh, noted this, the, hall, uh, the horse of murder, uh, the horse of murder, a treasury grant for the joys. Mr. Joy, that's the son-in-law of Mrs. Turner, who is serving a term of imprisonment in Makefield Jail for the complicity in the horse of murder. So he, he was jailed, and there was no report on that before that, and he has received a letter from Messrs. Williams and Edwards, solicitors to the West Riding, enclosing a cheque for £5. The letter states that this grant uh, has been made by the Treasury for special services rendered by Mr. and Mrs. Joy and their son George in giving evidence uh, against Walter Louis Turner and Mrs. Turner. So I think that he probably uh, ex, uh, would have not liked to have the check, but not liked to have been uh, sentenced to Wakefield Prison. I think in uh, towards the end of uh, the year or beginning of 1893, uh, I think there's a, an article on Mrs. Uh, Turner being released uh, from prison because she served uh, a year in there. I think he served Mr. Joy three months. I guess is that uh, if he had told uh, his, uh, Mrs. Turner uh, to go to the police station to hand in evidence, uh, he wouldn't have been seen to be complicit uh, in the matter. Uh, but again, he didn't really know anything about it and was just, uh, I don't know, uh, just trying to avoid what was actually going on uh, with his mother-in-law's life, which seemed to be a bit out of control with the coming and going all the time up uh, and down to Leeds. So rather a long story, but uh, it's all there and, and finished uh, uh, now in one evening because it would be uh, unfair to split it uh, uh, across two. Uh, but I say it's quite different uh, from the other accounts you read because you've got all that sort of toing and froing uh, from Leeds, which isn't in it, and the testimony from all those eyewitnesses who saw them on the uh, on, on the route. So I'll end there. But if you've got anything. To